Dear God, I just want to say thank you so much for the privilege of worshiping you tonight in this room. I want to thank you so much for the sacrifice that you did on the cross for each one of us and for the opportunity to, to get eternal life very soon. Today I have decided to tell my story. It's a testimony. And I just want to ask you that your name may be glorified tonight, even though it's a story of my life, but it's all about what you have done into my life. Thank you for the opportunity to share my story. And I ask for your Holy Spirit to be with all of us in this room tonight. Give me confidence and the right, the right words to tell this story. Thank you so much. We love you a lot. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, this is a huge audience. It's probably the largest that I've ever spoken to. But I want to say thank you first for coming. And uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Francisco. You've probably seen me around maybe making smoothies at the gazebo or your salad, right? Your chicken Caesar salad is very popular over there. And many of you guys come over and say, Francisco, can you make my salad for me? And uh, yeah, I'm Francisco da Silva. And today, um, I was invited by Pastor Borje last minute, like the day before yesterday. I was walking home, and I got a text on my phone. And uh, Pastor Borje was saying, Francisco, I hope you're going to be here this Friday night. And I said, yes, I'll be here, but why? Because I would like you to share your testimony with us. And uh, I didn't wait much time. I just said, okay, that would be great. And uh, here I am about to share my story with you. And uh, this is how it goes. It always starts when I was about 13 years old. I'm Brazilian. Do you have many Brazilians here today? Oh, okay. You guys are everywhere, especially that little small group that is always together, right? So I'm Brazilian, and uh, I grew up in Brazil in the countryside, country area in the southeast. It's called the state of Minas Gerais, but I was born in Sao Paulo. So I grew up in that little small city called Teixeiras, and uh, it was fun having, staying over there with my mom, my grandmother, my cousins, my siblings, and everybody. But when I was 13, something not really good happened. Uh, my grandpa, who was about 85 years old, he passed away. And he used to live in the very, very countryside of Brazil with grandma in a little farm over there, like an hour away from my house in that little small city. So my grandpa, he passed away, and my grandmother, she didn't like to come to the city at all, like at no cost. She wouldn't come to the city. And I remember my mom telling her, hey, let's move to the city because you can't stay here by yourself. And I don't know what we're going to do because we need you over there, and we don't feel like leaving you over here by yourself. And my, my grandmother, she didn't agree with that at all. And uh, here's what we did. My mom decided to move to the country and uh, stay over there with grandma. So I remember she came over one day, got the family together, and said, okay, guys, we're going to go to the countryside, like to the very country, the farm, and stay with grandma over there because she didn't, she didn't want to come and stay with us over here in the city. And uh, that was the deal. Um, we stayed over there for about three months, and because my mom was having like a hard time to come home every single night after work, it was an hour away, and it was the road, like it was that dirt roads, very bad conditions, and she was driving by herself. My mom decided to go back to the city. She said, okay, we can't stay here, like there's no way, but we're going to do something. And 
she came to me after staying over there for three months. I had made such good friends over there. I was like going to school and have, uh, having fun a lot. She came to me and said, Francisco, um, would you like to stay with grandma over here and take care of her? And I said, why not? It sounds good, right? I would be on my own. My mom would be far away, not telling me what to do anymore. Like, you got to go to school. You got to do homework and stuff like that. So I said, yes, I'll be here. No worries. And my mom, she left back to the small city. And uh, I started thinking that I was a grown-up boy already. So my grandma, she was not educated at all. Like, she didn't go to school. That's what I want to mean. Okay, she was a very polite woman. But she didn't go to school at all. And so whenever I didn't feel like going to school, I would come to grandma and say, Grandma, I don't feel like going to school today. And she would say, that's okay. Stay with me. Just keep me company. <laughs> so she was the best grandmother of, like, of my life and that, the only one almost. So she was amazing, and I loved to be with her. So I turned about 14, 15. I started going to parties and doing the bad things that many guys do, you know. And I remember one day, before telling you that, I got to tell you that my grandmother, she feared to be by herself in the farm. It was a, like a big house, and it was away from everywhere. Like, there was no other houses around us. And she didn't like to be by herself at all in that place. So what I would do, I would get together with my friends, go to the parties and stuff. And I remember one day coming up, like coming back home, three in the morning, and she was in the living room praying for me. Like she was feeling that something really bad was going to happen to me that night. And when I opened the door, she was waiting for me and pray, Francisco, I'm so glad that you came safe tonight. Don't go out again. I don't like to be by myself. And I said, but Grandma, I'm like 15 years old. I'm a boy. i got to have fun, you know, girls and stuff. <laughs> and she said, okay, I'm going to tell your mom, and she's going to do something about this. Yeah. And uh, she told my mom, I was turning 16, still having fun. And I remember one day, my mom came over and said, Francisco, I have decided that you're going to have to go back to the city with us. And our grandma decided to accept the deal, and she decided to move with us to the city. But I, I did not want to go back to the city at all. Like, no way. I had all my friends over there already. I, I was there for three and something already, three and a half years almost. And uh, I was working, and uh, friends in school, and she said, Francisco, you're not doing well in school. You're not taking care of your grandmother, and that's your task over here. So I just decided that you're going to go back to the city. You have to go. You have no options. And by the way, by the age of 16, I was doing so bad in school that I, was, I had lost three years of high school already. I was 16, and I was still a freshman in high school. That's how bad I was doing in school. So my mom was right, right? But I didn't want to obey her. But... I couldn't argue with her. So she decided to take me back to the city against my will. And when we got back to the small city in that country side, she put me back in school and said, now you're going to go back and study hard, okay? And I said, okay, mom, I'm, I'm going to try. And uh, something really interesting happened. I was going to school for about like a month, and uh, I just realized I told myself, Francisco, you don't like school. This is not for you. You're not born to go to school and study in books and stuff like that. You got to tell your mom that because you're not happy at all about this. And so did I. I finished that day, I remember, clear in my mind, and I said, I'm going to tell my mom that I don't like school. And I came home, I said, Mom, I got to tell you something really important. We got to have a conversation. And she was, okay, let's talk. And I said, all right, I don't like school at all. I hate school. I can't stand in a classroom where a teacher 
is going to teach me things that I don't have any interest about in learning. And so I'm just telling you the truth. I don't like school at all, and I don't want to go back at all. And I was really surprised because she looked at me at the eye, on the eyes, and she said, okay, so you're not going to school anymore. You don't have to go, but what are you going to do? And I had the right answer at that time, I think. Or actually, I thought about it. I had it. And I said, okay, I'm going to buy a motorcycle. I'm going to work in construction. It was the most easy job to find at that time. And I'm going to save some money and buy my motorcycle. That was my dream. And she said, okay, do it. You don't, have to, you don't need to go to school anymore. And here's when the story gets interesting. After the deal with my mom, not having to go to school anymore, on a beautiful Sunday morning, I was inside my house, and I heard a knock at the door. It was a couple of Jehovah Witnesses. Do you guys know them? Yeah, they're everywhere, right? I thought it was only in Brazil, but no. They're super committed and uh, persistent people. And in Brazil, every single Sunday, they're walking around your street. It doesn't matter if you close the door, shut the door at their face. If you tell them, hey, I don't want to study the Bible at all. Don't need, you don't need to come back. You don't need to offer me again. They're going to be back again next week. <laughs> really, I'm not kidding. So Sunday morning, I heard the knock at the door, Jehovah Witnesses. I opened the door. They start telling me a story about the Bible. I don't really remember what the story it was, but I think it was the creation story. And uh, it caught my attention. They were telling me in such a way that I got, whoa, this is interesting. So they were telling me the story, and after they finished telling me the story, they said, would you like to have a Bible study with us? Like, on a week base, we're going to come every week to your house and teach you the Bible. I still don't know why or how, but I said yes. I accepted the deal. I said, yes, let's study the Bible. And from that week on, they started coming to my house every single week to teach me the Bible. And I remember the first lesson that they taught me they gave me a Bible, a Bible verse to memorize. So this guy, he would give me a Bible verse, and on the other week, he would come back, and I had to memorize it for him and tell him what the verse was. And the, verse, the first verse was John 3.16. That's the most easy, easiest one, right? So I was memorizing verses, learning about the Bible, and about two or three more months passed by, and a friend of my family an Adventist guy, he heard that I was studying the Bible with the Jehovah Witnesses people. He came over to my house and said, Francisco, this is unacceptable. <laughs> we are friends for such a long time. You never studied the Bible with me. I didn't say like you never offered me, but I thought in my mind. <laughs> and... Uh, now you're studying the Bible with strangers, and they're not even teaching you the truth. I'm going to have to teach you the Bible too, so you're going to have another Bible study, all right? <laughs> for real, for three more months, I was having two Bible studies every week with Jehovah Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> and they got into contradictions because both of them, they would use the Bible to teach me. And one guy would tell me the Sabbath, we had to keep the Sabbath. And the other guy would tell me that we didn't have to keep the Sabbath. But both of them used the same book, the Bible. One guy would tell me that Jesus is not God. And the other guy would tell me that Jesus is God. And they both used the Bible. I got really confused at some point. And then as three months passed by, I decided to quit the Bible study with Jehovah Witnesses. And... Uh, a month after, I got baptized at the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is the first part of my story that I want to tell you today. And uh, before moving on to the second part, I want to tell you something really important. And uh, if you forget everything that I said, the story, how I got baptized, how I became a Christian and everything, I want you to remember this. 
whenever you really give your life to God, like truly you decided to give your life, to commit your life to God, huge changes are about to change, like to happen. Your life will change, like totally. It's, I feel like he's, he's going to mold you now. And he's going to make you into that person that he always wanted you to be. But since you did not accept, you're living your own life away from him, he couldn't do anything. So now that you decided to give your life to him, he's going to change you, like, a lot. So don't forget this. Whenever you truly give your life to God, he's going to change you into the person that he wanted you to be. The second part is even more interesting. And uh, before going to that, I'm going to tell you, I'm a very emotional person. And if by the end of this second part, I start crying, don't mind, okay? (laughs) Don't worry, I will be okay. (laughs) But here's how it goes. I got baptized. On the very day of my baptism, my pastor came over, came over to me and said, Francisco, would you like to study in a boarding school, a seven-day boarding school? And I said, what is a boarding school? I, never, I had never heard of it. And he explained to me, oh, it's a school where you're going to live inside. Well, like, you're going to have roommates, three other guys in the same room with you, and you're going to have to work. And... Uh, Basically, that's it. Maybe you're going to come home like once in a year or two times in a year. And you're going to have to move to another state, which is Rio de Janeiro. You guys heard of Rio de Janeiro? It's a, it's a beautiful city. And I said, all right. That sound, it doesn't sound bad at all. Just tell me what I need to do and I'm going to go. Sorry. And he said, Okay. I'm going to give you an application form. You're going to fill it up. And I'm going to give you to a friend of mine who is one of the authorities in this school. And we're going to try to get a scholarship for you over there. Because I didn't have any financial conditions to pay for my um, um, school funds, like going over there to boarding school. So he gave me the application. I filled it out, gave it back to him. He gave it to the guy over there. And after two more months, I got an, an interview with the recruiter of the school. I went to this other city to meet with him. He asked me so many questions, and at the very end of the interview, he said, Francisco, I gotta tell you something. We have 400 applications every year, every year for this school. And we, among all this 400, we only choose 20 people. So I don't wanna give you any expectations, like get you high and waiting to get the scholarship. So I just wanted you to pray about it, go back home, and just wait, okay? And I said, okay. Six months passed, and I, I really forgot about that. Like, I wasn't even thinking about that school anymore. And then I got a call from this school. I got a call, and they said, Francisco, you were contemplated. You got a full scholarship to come to boarding school. You don't have to pay anything besides your um, registration fee, which was like very little money at that time. But you have to be here in 30 days, and you're going to have to work full time over here. So you're going to go study and work for the school. That's how you're going to pay for the school. And that's how it works in Brazil, the system, when you get a full scholarship to go to boarding school or even college. So I got the full scholarship, told my family, told my church family now that I was going to church, Seventh-day Adventist church. And by the, by the time I had got back to school, so I was finishing my freshman year of high school after I have been, like, lost for three years, not going to school at all. So I finished my freshman year, and before going to school, I told you guys I had to get the money to pay for the registration fee, right? And I remember one day we found this guy, my friend and I. He wanted to paint his house. He was a really rich man in the city. So he said, hey, guys, I know that you guys need money, right? And I want to paint my house, so let's make a deal. You guys paint my house, and I give you the money, and Francisco can go to Rio for the school that he's he's got the scholarship. And I said, sounds good. It took us about 
25 days to paint the huge house. We finished everything. I got my money, got my suitcase, put my clothes inside, got in Rio de Janeiro, the most beautiful city in Brazil, in my opinion. And uh, I was in boarding school, enjoying life. And uh, how many of you guys went to boarding school here? Was it fun? Awesome, right? I used to tell my friends that boarding school, it, they were the, the two best years of my life. I had so much fun. And I reserved a story to tell you today, guys, something that happened over there. That's how we used to have fun in boarding school in Brazil. All the boys, one day, we decided to prank the girls. <laughs> right? You know already what's going to happen. So we got together, all the boys, and say, let's prank the girls. And uh, here's the plan. We would create a fire in the girls' dorm. That's a lot, right? <laughs> Look at this. But first, I'm going to tell you that we told all the school's authorities, like the, the school principal, they are all aware about it. So it was totally OK. <laughs> so we create a fire in the girls' dorm in order to get them out of the dorm. But before they got out of the dorm, all the boys would be up in the last floor with eggs on their hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And when we get all the girls down outside, we'd throw the eggs on them. That was a prank. And the school director, he was aware of it. So we set up the plan, and guess who they chose to create the fire? Francisco. <laughs> we got a mattress, and I got another guy with me. So I climbed the wall, got into the rooftop, and the, this guy passed me the mattress. I put it in the right spot over there, like watching around to see if the fire wouldn't, wouldn't spread around and like get really into the dorm. So I got it on fire, and I was waiting a little bit. And all of a sudden, I saw a girl on the other side. It was a huge building, like four floors, I think. The girl was over there on the other side, and she saw me. And once she saw me, she said, oh, the boys are here. It's a prank. They were trying to get us out of the dorm. And all the girls heard it, and they were making fun of us. Oh, we're not getting into that. And our prank failed. <laughs> On the next morning, we went to breakfast, like 7 in the morning. The girls came and, like, making fun of us, telling that our prank failed and it wasn't wise enough for them. And that's how we used to have fun in boarding school back in Brazil. And it's only one story, okay, out of many. So boarding school was amazing for me. And it was only two years that I had this much of fun over there. And uh, my freshman year, I was, actually, sorry, my senior year of high school, as I was completing my, my career over there, almost done with everything. It was the month of September, I believe. And uh, the school principal came over, got everybody together, and uh, he said, hey, guys, in about 15 days, we're going to have somebody really special visiting us, and this person is going to preach to us over here on a Saturday morning. And the person was Dr. Andresen, Andrews University president. Is he here tonight? No, right? Okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not telling anything bad about him. So he came over. He was going to come over in 15 days, and the school principal told us about that. And on, the very, on that very day that he told us that Dr. Andresen was coming to visit, I remember going back to my room, and before going to bed, I got my Bible, and I read a story, a very simple story, small the, but that it got my attention. And I'm going to read it for you guys to, right now. It's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 13 through 18. If you have your Bible, you want to open. I don't have the slides. Um, not, no PowerPoints, but 
Here's how it goes. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 13 through 18. I also observed this example of wisdom on earth, and it seemed important to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it, surrounded, and built a massive snare against it. Now there was found within it a poor but very wise man. He delivered the city by his wisdom, but not one person remembered that poor man. So I concluded, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the wisdom of the poor is rejected, and his words are never heard. The softly spoken words of the wise are to be heard rather than shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons, and a single sinner can destroy a lot of good. That was the story that I read that night. I finished reading the story, closed my Bible, went to bed, slept, and, oh, sorry, I was forgetting something really important. Before I finished closing my Bible, I got so captivated by the story that I decided to write it down in a very small little piece of paper, and I wrote Ecclesiastes 9, 13 to 18. Got that little piece of paper, put it inside my ID card, which was together with my keys, and I put it in my neck for seven days because I wanted to memorize it. That's how I really liked that um, story in the Bible. And uh, I stayed with it for like seven days, memorized the verse, and uh, I remember even sharing it with some, a, a friend of mine in a worship morning. I shared with him, more, seven days more passed by, and uh, Dr. Andresen came over to visit our school in Rio. As he was there, Saturday morning, preaching, he opened his Bible. I clearly remember that. And he started telling a story from the Bible. And guess what the story was? Ecclesiastes 9, 13 to 18. He told this story in a very, I could say, in a very wise way. As he finished this story, he didn't tell his audience where the story was in the Bible. He finished telling the story, and he closed his Bible and looked at everybody and said, does anybody know where the story is in the Bible? We had about 900 to 1,000 people in that day. Maybe 25 to 30 pastors. Because in Brazil, whenever you get somebody from far away, everybody wants to come and see that person. So we got a lot of people visiting on that day. Dr. Andresen asked that. Nobody said anything. And he decided to say, all right, I'm not going to give us a full scholarship at Andrews University for whoever tells me where the story is in the Bible. All right. I was in the very back of the church. I was, a, I was a RA at that time. And over there, I think it's the same rule over here in boarding school, where boys stay on one side and the girls on the other side, right? So my job was to take care of the boys, and I was watching them so that none would jump over to the girl's side, and you know what I mean. <laughs> so I was in the very back of the church watching the boys, not paying like, much attention in the sermon, but when he said that, a scholarship, <laughs> I was finishing my senior year of high school. I had no clue what I was going to, and I didn't know what I was going to study at all. So when he said, I'm going to give a scholarship or whoever tells me where the story is in the Bible, I didn't bring my Bible on that day, but I had the Bible right in front of me. And a friend of mine that guy that I had shared with him, he slapped my neck and said, Francisco, isn't it the story that you told me the other day 
Where is it? <laughs> no, no, no. I didn't tell him. <laughs> I got the Bible in the front seat. Check it out first. And by the way, I was a very shy person at that time. And uh, before telling him that I knew this story, my friend said, Francisco, you know this story. Raise your hand and tell them. And I was, I don't know, what if it's wrong? Everybody's going to make fun of me later. You know, high school friends. <laughs> you got to tell them, Francisco. So finally, I decided to raise my hand. And the guy who was translating Dr. Andresen, I could see in, in his eyes that he was so excited about getting somebody to, to get the scholarship that when I raised my hand, he shouted really loud, There! <laughs> We got somebody. And the entire church just turned over to me. Boom. Literally, I could listen to the next nose like boom. I got red. I, got, I was shaking. Purple. Everybody looking at me. And I just asked, is it Ecclesiastes 9, 13 to 18? And uh, by that time, the guy didn't even have to translate it to Dr. Andresen because the words are very similar. The book Ecclesiastes, Dr. Andresen just said, yes, you got the scholarship. I was, whoa. <laughs> Everybody was clapping and like, whoa, Francisco. The worship finished. Friends came over to talk to me and... Uh, that's how I came to Andrews, with the full scholarship. Thank you. And uh, before I finish everything, I just want to tell you something. And it's on John chapter 3, verse 8. And I'm going to read it. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And with that verse, I just want to pray with you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the great, amazing things that you've done in my life, and I'm really sure that many of you here have experienced many things as well. Thank you so much for your great, amazing love and for forgiveness, your grace. And tonight, before going back home, we together, we want to ask you that you may help us to know you more, and to remember that whenever we truly give our lives to you, you're going to change us, and you're going to mold us into that person that you want each one of us to be. Thank you so much for everything. We love you a lot, and please come back as soon as possible. In your name we pray, amen.